Um, so uh, for everyone who has registered, um, you'll get a follow-up email uh, once the recording has been posted. Uh, so if you wanted to watch again or share with a friend, you'll have that link. I'll send that out uh, sometime uh, next week. Um, so I think that's it for me. Um, so just want to turn it over to Marlene from uh, Naturescaping of Southwest Washington. Hello, everybody. It's Marlene from Naturescaping. So um, for those of you who may be members, this is part of your membership benefits. For others, um, in partnership with the Canvas Library, we're offering this Zoom class for you. Um, we appreciate any donations you might want to cast in our direction, and you can do that online. Now, this is kind of new for us, but uh, you're welcome to, to give us a donation of any kind if you like online. It's naturescaping.org. Um, Elliot will be putting that uh, in the chat so you can have that link. You can go there and you can you can easily find it, I'm sure. And also, I just wanted to announce that for those of you who are, are familiar with our annual plant sale, we are working on that now. We will be having our plant sale April 30th, and that's a Saturday, and then the Sunday, May 1st, at least to begin with. We'll see what happens after that if we have leftovers. But if you are interested in coming to that event, there'll be more information on our website. If you are interested in volunteering, whether you're a member or not is not necessary. If you'd like to volunteer to help with the plant sale, um, you also get a free plan for doing that. Um, you can contact me directly. Again, my email address will also be put in the chat. So you can contact me directly for that or go to our website for more information. Either way, that'd be great. So I wanted to thank Brandon from the Backyard Bird Shop for doing this presentation for us. He's wonderful and I'm sure you all will see that as we go along. And thank you so much to Elliot at the Canvas Library for assisting us. He's been a great partner all this time during the pandemic and we really appreciate it. So without further ado, I will turn it over to Brandon. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Marlene and Elliot. Um, I'm Brandon Berger. I uh, work at the Backyard Bird Shop Vancouver. Um, and I've been doing these uh, sort of educational talks to uh, nonprofit groups and uh, the community uh, throughout Clark County for probably the past eight years or so. Um, my background is in biology with a bachelor's from Eastern Washington University, uh, focusing on mammalogy, uh, botany, and ornithology. Um, so I'm here today to uh, speak about uh, spring bird ID. Um, particularly focusing on sparrows because uh, they kind of all look alike if you don't know what to look for. Um, but first, because it is February and uh, springtime hummingbirds uh, begin nesting in February, I wanted to touch a little bit on the two, possibly three hummingbirds that you might see uh, coming up here. Um, the Andes hummingbird is a year-round resident. Um, we have them uh, all throughout the year, even during freezing weather. Um, and they begin nesting in mid to late February. So they've already started their uh, courtship behavior and their nest building behavior. Um, the Rufus hummingbird, the other uh, long time or hummingbird that we have here that's considered a resident in Clark County, um, gets back in late March, early April, um, and are here through September before they head south again. Um, the difference uh, between a uh, Anna's and a Rufus is Rufus is a little bit smaller and is uh, distinctly has rusty red on them. Um, the male has a completely rusty red back, as you can see there on the right side. And on the, uh, the females will have a little bit of uh, rusty on their sides as well. Um, the Anna's has a, uh, the whole head of the male is covered in the iridescent uh, fuchsia colored uh, feathers. Um, and the females are green. Um, Anna's is the largest hummingbird in the United States, which is why they uh, overwinter um, during our fairly mild Western Washington and Oregon winters. Um, and then the third type that you can sometimes see is the calliope hummingbird. Um, that is the US's smallest hummingbird. So we have both the largest and the smallest. 
Um, technically, their official range isn't any farther west than Lyle in the Columbia River Gorge. But since it's just a river valley, they're known to uh, zip on down and visit Vancouver and Portland, particularly if you live along the uh, river, there's a good chance you can see them a couple times a year. Um, but on to talking about the hummingbirds uh, courtship, uh, you might start seeing this anytime now. Um, the uh, male uh, courts the female by uh, doing a dive from high in the air where they perform a J-shaped arc at the very bottom. Um, and at the bottom of that uh, arc, they spread their tails and uh, it causes a, a high chirp sound. Um, for many, many years, uh, we thought they were making that chirp sound with their uh, vocals. Um, but with the advent of uh, high speed cameras and stop motion, um, we discovered that it's actually their tail feathers being spread at the very bottom of that arc. Um, and the uh, wind velocity through their feathers causes that chirp. Um, and the females judge the males based on their performance of this dive and the uh, loudness of the chirp. Um, and again, this behavior begins in mid to late February. So uh, if you see some hummingbirds buzzing around your yard and you see one flying way up high in the air and then dive bombing really fast down towards the ground and pulling up last minute, uh, he's trying to impress a lady nearby. And here's a, a photo that someone took with a high energy or high uh, uh, high speed camera, excuse me, um, of that uh, Anna's hummingbird performing that J arc. And as you can see in the circled red area is where they spread their tail and that chirp happens. Um, and then their tails folded back up as they continue uh, the finish the arc. Um, and uh, Anna's hummingbird nests, uh, you should be able to start finding soon. Um, and since they're building them now, it's a good time to try to spot them before the leaves uh, finish uh, showing up on all the trees. Um, they build their nests on small forks and, and branches in trees uh, six to 20 feet high. Um, sometimes on uh, lines like closed lines under covered areas or strings of lights, although that's fairly uncommon, especially in uh, our area where there are so many trees available. Um, the female does all the work building the nest and they, she uses primarily lichen, moss, feathers, and she binds it all together with spider webs. Um, she lays two eggs, incubates them for about two, little over two weeks, and they uh, fledge after about 20 more days after that. Um, and she can potentially uh, raise two or three broods each year. So she can uh, have two or three uh, go arounds of uh, laying and sitting on eggs. Um, and she may reuse uh, the nest year after year as well, building it up, making it taller and taller. Um, the young after they fledge are usually hanging out with her for about one week. Uh, she'll teach them a little bit of you know how to find nectar and their own food. Um, but after that week is done, they become competition for uh, her energy sources. So she will chase them out of her territory uh, after they're about a, a week fledged. Um, as at that point, they are uh, taking away her energy, so they uh, need to move on and find their own sources. Um, but what we really want to talk about today is uh, bird ID. Um, a lot of folks, when they're teaching bird ID, start with who you're looking at. You know, what parts, they go over the parts of the bird. You know, you're looking at an eye line or a crown, mustache or breasts, um, whether they have a crest or not. Um, looking at the different colors that may be on the flank or the rump, um, wing bars, etc. Where I like to start, while this is all you know very important information, um, and but that's all you can gather at a glance, and so you can you know kind of note the the primary colors and the patterns at a, a quick glance. But to really help you narrow down who you're looking at, especially if a bird is primary uh, primarily brown, um, we have a term in ornithology called a uh, little brown bird or little brown jobby. Um, which refers to any little brown bird that you saw, but you could not, you know, ID at the time. You didn't have time, they were flitting by fast, or you, all you could make out from the distance was brown. Um, and that's actually legitimate if you're out recording every bird you see in a journal. If you see a little brown bird, but you didn't get a, a good ID on it, you jot it down as a LBB or an LBJ. Um, but you can really help narrow down those brown birds and who you're looking at based on that observation by starting out where they were at. So birds tend to hang out 
uh, in uh, areas of the habitat um, that they find their food and their nests. Uh, so uh, sparrows, thrushes, towhees, wrens, they tend to hang out on the ground layer, maybe a little bit up into the shrub layer. Um, and uh, they eat a lot of insects off the ground or seeds that have fallen. Um, where uh, juncos, goldfinches, hummingbirds, they tend to hang out in the shrub layer, so a little bit larger bushes. You don't see them on the ground very often, um, and you don't usually see them too high up in the uh, canopy either. Um, owls, jays, kinglets, and woodpeckers, chickadees, and nuthatches, they like to be up in the understory canopy, so higher than the shrub layer, um, but below the uh, overstory canopy where they might be uh, visible to hawks and other aerial predators. Um, and then up in the overstory, overstory canopy, you would have uh, birds like flycatchers, crossbills, uh, your swallows who uh, eat a lot of insects on the wing uh, hang out up there. Your hawks hang out up there looking for birds down below. Um, your pigeons tend to like to hang up there as well, that high, uh, high uh, visibility area, keep a like, lookout for predators as well. Um, so noting where you saw that brown bird really narrows down, you know, what sort of family of bird you're looking at. You know, if you saw it on the ground, it's not likely to be a kinglet. It's probably going to be a sparrow or a wren. Um, and so that can really help narrow down what you're looking at. Uh, other important things to pay attention to if you can't quite get a good ID based on visual colors and markings is what they are doing. Um, hummingbirds are nectivores, so they're going to be visiting flowers, drinking nectar. Um, uh, vertivores, or uh, uh, birds that eat vertebrates, are going to be hunting for birds and small mammals. Um, an insectivore, like a woodpecker, will be uh, pecking on a tree to pull insects out of the bark, or uh, possibly, like bush tits do, they glean insects off of the shrub layer leaves. Um, scavengers, if they're scavenging carcasses, there's a good chance it's going to be like a vulture. Uh, around here we have turkey vultures. Or if they're diving into uh, water catching fish, um, you know, that's all signs of how, what they're doing. Um, and that also can help you narrow down since, you know, not very many birds eat other birds, you know, you're looking at probably some sort of raptor. You know, very few birds uh, are nectivores like hummingbirds, so you would know you're looking at a hummingbird if they're visiting flowers. Um, if they're gleaning insects from leaves, you're not really probably looking at a woodpecker or a sparrow, um, so that helps narrow down a little bit of who you're looking at, possibly a bush tit or a chickadee, a nuthatch. Um, so again, you're, you're narrowing down that, uh, that family of bird you're looking at. Um, and then part of that what is how they're doing it. Um, if they're going up and down the bark of a tree gleaning insects, that narrows it down from, uh, say, a bush tit or a, a wren that's gleaning insects out of the leaves. Um, if they're uh, gleaning uh, insects out of the ground, you're possibly looking at a, a robin or a thrush as opposed to a woodpecker who'd be doing that on a tree. Um, some birds like uh, kingfishers and um, well, kingfishers will do an aquatic perch and a sally down into the water catching a fish and then back up to that perch to eat the fish. Um, Flycatchers will do that from up in the air or on the tall, like top of canopies. And they will uh, sally out into the air, catch an insect, and bring it back to the, uh, the perch that they had flown from to eat it. Um, other species will sally out to get birds off a of sur- or off insects off of surfaces. Others will sally down and grab insects off the ground. Um, flickers is a, a type of woodpecker we have in our area. And while they're known to love suet and pull insects off of bark and out of trees, one of their absolute favorite foods is ants. So it's not unusual to see a flicker hanging around on the ground, particularly in like a gravel uh, driveway area, um, eating uh, ants that they're finding down there. Um, so that would help you uh, kind of determine if you're looking at a flicker or another type of woodpecker, because not all woodpeckers would be down on the ground eating ants. And so you look at, you know, what they're doing and how they're doing that. And that really helps to narrow down, um, you know, who, who you saw that was just a little brown bird. Um, and then, of course, when. Uh, you know, not all birds are in the same area at 
the same time, you know, at different times of the year. Uh, so what helps, uh, most bird guides will have a range map that will show you where those birds are during what part of the year, whether they're in the area during the summer or winter, are they year round? Um, are they only in the area when they're migrating through, which is probably um, both spring or fall migration. Um, some birds uh, take two different routes to go south and north. So they might be in your area during spring migration, but not fall migration or vice versa. Um, and that's an important thing to look at too, because you know if you're looking at a bird that's not here in the summer, or if, and you think you're looking at a bird rather that's not here in the summer, and it's summer, it's probably not going to be that bird. So you know to look elsewhere. Um, and then you know all those what you saw on your first glance are become important now that you kind of you know what they're doing, where they're at, how they're doing it. Uh, now you can look at, you know, what's the shape of the beak? Um, did they have any markings on the top of the head? Um, does their rump have a, a unique color that uh, maybe it was a little more golden on the rump rather than just brown? Um, and that's where you narrow down to exactly who you're looking at. Um, and this image here are important uh, terms to know when you're using a, a bird guide, because these are what they will refer to uh, specific areas of the bird's body. Um, when they make notes of uh, important identifying markers like wing bars or the mustache, um, eye lines, a very common one, uh, or a, a crown is very common, um, color of the breast, um, whether or not they have a crest. Most birds don't have crests, but a few do. Um, in our area, notably, is the uh, jays. Uh, Stellar's jay, the uh, blue jay with the uh, black head, they have a crest. The scrub jay, the more bluish gray jay, they do not have a crest. Um, so that's a quick way, you know, if, if you didn't know they're necessarily their colorations off the top of your head, you know one has a crest and the other doesn't. That's a quick and easy way to tell which of those jays you're looking at. Um, and so now let's talk about some sparrows. So we have uh, several species of sparrows in the area. Um, not all of them are year round, but many of them are. Um, but they're all pretty much brown birds. Um, so it can be confusing to know who you're looking at. Um, first thing about sparrows is they hang out in the understory or on the ground. Um, they're what we refer to as a ground feeder. Um, they eat primarily uh, grass seeds like millet, um, sunflower seeds and wheat seeds, things like that, that have fallen to the ground. Um, they occasionally eat insects as well that they find down there. Uh, but rarely are they going to be up off of the ground or out of the uh, understory area. You rarely see a, a sparrow very high up off the ground in a tree. Um, they might hop up onto, say, a top of a fence to get a good uh, view of the surrounding area above the foliage they're normally in, or to, uh, you know, sing their song to attract a mate during the uh, breeding season. Um, and two of the most common sparrows you're going to see in our area are the song sparrow and the fox sparrow. And at a first glance, they can be difficult to tell apart um, until you start learning a little bit about what the different uh, markings are. So on the left-hand side, we have the song sparrow. Um, song sparrow in our area is very browny gray, uh, more of a sooty color. Um, oftentimes in uh, guides, you'll see them a, a brighter brown, um, but ours in our area tend to be a little more muted, more gray. Um, and uh, what I always look for initially to tell if I'm looking at a song sparrow or a fox sparrow is the chest um, the, or the breast. The song sparrow has, almost always has a uh, dark colored spot in the center, as you can see on the lower image on the right. Um, in our area, in my experience, it tends to be more of a purpley brown. Um, but you know, as you go out from Clark County, there, there may be slight variations in the colors. Um, and they also have a brown and gray uh, crown. Uh, the uh, fox sparrow um, on their breast, while they might have some of the markings somewhat making a spot like you see there on the right hand side, um, they don't always. Um, but a distinctive way to tell the difference is the song sparrow has more mostly vertical striations on the breast. The uh, fox sparrow has distinct chevrons or those uh, triangle uh, uh, forms, and they're often uh, in pretty straightish lines as well. 
Um, this individual, they're a little more random, but I've seen them be pretty much, you know, vertical rows of uh, chevrons. Um, also, the back of them tend to, they don't have much gray on their backs like the Song Sparrow does. They more of a chocolatey brown in our area, almost like someone took uh, Hershey's chocolate and drizzled it all over their back. Um, and then song-wise, uh, song sparrows, hence the name, um, have a almost endlessly varied song. Individuals make up their own notes, and every individual gen tended to have a unique song eventually. They may incorporate pieces of songs from other sparrows that they hear, um, but they usually end up, at, you know, as they get older, coming up with their own unique songs. And so they uh, serenade their, uh, their mates to attract them, the males do. Um, but that's the, uh, you know, the spot on the chest is what I always look for when I'm looking at a song sparrow and or see if it's a song sparrow or a fox sparrow rather. Um, other uh, common sparrows we have in the area are our crowned or throated sparrows. Um, we have the white crowned sparrow here year round um, and it's pretty easy to tell right off because it has, well, like the name suggests, white crown. Um, and so it has a, a white stripe on the top of the head, um, then two black stripes, and then two white stripes, and then they have a black eye stripe that goes right through the center of the eye there, uh, as you can see on the left. Um, on the right, we is mostly a winter resident, although we do have uh, some year-round populations in our area, um, is the golden-crowned uh, sparrow. Um, and as you can see on the picture there, they have a distinct uh, gold spot on the top of their head there on the crown, hence where they get their name. Um, they don't really have much white, although sometimes behind that yellow can be white and below the black can be a little whiter than you're seeing in the image here. Um, but their uh, black part of their crown doesn't go through the center of the eye. It touches the top of the eye, but it doesn't go through the center. Um, and so those are two important markers. Otherwise, these two birds are very similar in plumage and size. Um, and then we have a rare winter resident in our area called the uh, white-throated sparrow. Um, tends to be a little bit darker in plumage, but you can't always rely on that. Um, has yellow and white both, like both the golden crown and the white crown sparrow, but as you can see the yellow is uh, right above the eyes. It's not in the center of the crown. Um, and you won't see yellow like that on a white crown sparrow. Um, also the uh, throat is uh, as the name suggests, white, um, but that can sometimes be hard to see depending on how the bird's uh, looking at you or not. But the yellow above the eyes is very distinctive. Um, but so you'd wanna note whether that yellow is above the eyes or in the center of the crown um, to tell the difference between a white-throated and a golden crown. And no yellow at all, you're likely looking at a uh, white crown. Um, females of all these species are going to be very muted and very similar in color and plumage, so they can be very difficult to tell apart. Um, so if you're seeing uh, females and can't quite tell who you're looking at, you know, hang around, look around. Sooner or later, you're probably going to spot one of the males, and that'll really tell you, you know, who, who you're looking at, because the females will tend to hang around the males of their species. Um, other uh, common uh, sparrows we have in our area are the dark-eyed junco uh, and the spotted toey. Um, these two are easy to tell apart from each other due to their size. The junco is a relatively small sparrow, smaller than all the other sparrows, and the toey is a little bit bigger than your average sparrow. It's almost robin-sized. Um, both of them are year-round residents. Um, we actually have two color morphs of the dark-eyed junco in our area. Um, we have the uh, most common, the Oregon race, which is the one you're seeing on the upper left uh, photo there. Um, males have a distinctive black hood, we call it, um, and uh, a kind of a rusty, uh, not really rusty, a, a brown uh, back with a little bit reddish brown side under the wing. Um, sometimes if it's a female, that uh, hood's gonna be more gray than black. Um, and some of the other, but most of the other colorations are pretty uh, the same between males and females on the, the Oregon race. Um, the other color we have is the slate-sided junco, um, which is the lower left-hand photo there. And as you can see, they have a distinct gray hood that just continues right on down the back and into the side. Uh, so little to no brown on the, uh, the slate-sided junco. 
Um, they're not quite as common as the uh, Oregon race, but you do uh, occasionally see them in our area. A um, little bit more higher elevations, um, but I've seen them here at the store and uh, out in uh, Hawkinson as well um, when I used to live out there uh, years ago. Um, and then your spotted towhee, um, a lot of people mistake them at a first glance for a robin um, because they have that red on their side and we know robins have red breasts, um, black on the back. Again, robins tend to be black on the back, a black head. Uh, but there are some distinctive differences. Um, one, while the robin hangs out on the ground, um, it's probing, it has a longer beak and is probing into the ground for uh, worms and grubs. The spotted towhee is hopping around looking for uh, seeds mostly. Um, another easy uh, way to tell, so you can see its eye, is the uh, spotted towhee has a red eye, as you can see there, uh, very distinctive. Um, and their uh, front of their breast is white, not red. Um, but depending on the angle of the bird, you can't always see that. Um, and they uh, get the name spotted towhee by the uh, spots on their wing. Um, Years and years ago, it used to be called the rufous-sided towhee, um, but about 15 years or so ago, they uh, changed the name over to spotted towhee, uh, decided it was a, a different uh, enough species here in the West than what the Eastern uh, uh, version of the towhee was. Um, and genetic testing showed it to be its own species. Um, I don't remember what they changed the, the Eastern towhee's name to, um, the version of him, but uh, our Western one became the spotted towhee. Um, both of these being sparrows, again, hang out on the ground or near the ground. Um, spotted towhees love brush piles. So if you have a big brush pile on or near your property, there's probably some towhees hanging around near it or in it. And another thing they absolutely love, which is why I had so many of these out in Hawkinson when I lived there, is blackberry thickets. So if you have a lot of mounds of overgrowing blackberries, I can almost guarantee there's probably a towhee living in one or more of them. Um, and they tend to uh, hang out in pairs, especially during the breeding season. But even throughout the year, they tend to be paired off with each other, um, a male and a female hanging out and living together. A um, bit more of a monogamous bird than other sparrows. Um, and then some other sparrows that you might see in our area, but are uh, much less common. Um, is, one is the uh, chipping sparrow. Um, it's a summer resident here in western Clark County. So you may see it along the Columbia River in western Clark County, up towards uh, and into uh, Ridgefield in that area. Um, but you're not likely to see very many, if any, on the east side of Clark County. They tend to hang out around the river there. Um, and as you can see, they're uh, a bit more distinctive from your other sparrows. They're not quite as dark a brown. Um, a little bit of brown on the back and on the wing, um, grayish sides. They have a, a very straight black eye stripe, as you can see, cutting through the uh, eye, um, a, a uh, white eyebrow. Um, and then they have a, uh, a rusty red cap on top of their or crown on top of their head. Um, and you might also note very closely there is there's just a little bit of spot of black on either side of the uh, beak right there at the top of the crown with a white spot between them. Um, again, not always the easiest to see when depending on how they're angled or sitting, um, but definitely a, a bit more distinct from your other sparrows um, in the area. Um, another a winter resident we have around here is the Lincoln Sparrow. Um, and they have, uh, their plumage is patterned differently than many of the other sparrows in the area. Um, as you can see, not really any distinctive marks on the breast, um, but there on the crown, um, it's a, a mottled or spotted uh, brown and black, almost checkered-ish pattern. Um, and that's fairly distinctive when you see them. Um, that coloration continues there a little bit on the sides and just behind the eye, there's an eye stripe behind the eye that has that same uh, brown and black checkered, checkered uh, color. Um, and they, they don't, won't always have that uh, buff colored uh, cheek there. Um, sometimes it's a little bit more the uh, checkered as well. Um, but again, not a very common resident, but they are known to uh, be in our area during the winter. 
Um, and then another fun one you don't see very often, although they are a year round two winter resident. And I believe you can see some of these guys out towards Stegerwald National Wildlife Refuge and up towards uh, uh, Richfield as well along the lower Columbia um, is the Savannah Sparrow. Um, there's, there's more of them east of the Cascades, uh, but there are a few here in the lower Columbia as well, west of the Cascades. And as you can see, they have a very distinctive yellow golden uh, eyebrow or eye stripe right above the eye. Um, the top of their head and crown is uh, brown. Um, and again, not really very distinct markings on the breast, uh, more vertical striations, but they're not as sooty gray as the uh, song sparrow was. Um, and so um, that's most of our sparrows in the area that you would see. Um, you're gonna see a lot of song sparrows. If you see a sparrow, there's a good chance who you're initially looking at is gonna be a song sparrow or a fox sparrow. Um, and, and they're about a medium sized sparrow. They're your average. Um, a good, a good uh, bird to base when you're looking at whether it's bigger or smaller for sparrows is a song sparrow because it's, it's your average size sparrow. Um, then you got your larger sparrows, your white crowned, white throated and golden. Again, the distinctive marks are all gonna be found up above the eyes on the crown. Uh, your, your common uh, ones, they're pretty easy to tell at a glance, mainly because of their size and their coloration is so different from your other sparrows. Um, the towhee is larger, uh, about the size of a robin again, and the uh, junco is smaller, um, fatter than, but you know, about a, a finch size, maybe a little, little stockier than a finch. And then your uncommon ones, which you know, they're they're again an average, uh, mediumish size sparrow. Um, savannah sparrows that I've seen tend to look a little sleeker than other sparrows, um, but that really depends on just how they're holding their plumage. <laughs> Um, and uh, so those are your, your sparrows, and I'll be glad to take some uh, questions on those here at the end of the presentation. Um, I know there's, there's a lot to unpack there. And again, all your sparrows are going to be hanging out on or near the ground. They are, they are ground feeders, and pretty much all sparrows love uh, millet. Um, most birds will eat sunflower. You just have to offer it to these guys uh, on an open tray or directly on the ground. Um, they on feeders, they're usually not very comfortable going much higher than three feet off the ground. Although, if they, you know they they learn that your yard's a pretty safe yard, they may venture higher um, to get food off of uh, of feeders that are uh, hanging higher in the five foot range. Um, but it, it takes a while for them to kind of learn to trust your yard and know that there's not a lot of predators that might pick them off at that height. Um, other birds I wanted to touch on, because uh, they can be difficult to tell apart, um, is later in the spring, uh, we'll be getting our uh, swallows back. Um, and we have three main uh, species of swallow in our area that uh, nest here. Um, we have the tree swallow and the violet green swallow. Um, and these guys, especially when they're flying, can be pretty difficult to tell apart. Um, they're both uh, spring and summer residents. Um, what I look for on the tree swallow, even though they have a little bit bluer plumage than the violet green swallow, and the violet green has a little greener plumage than the tree swallow, um, that again can be really hard to tell when they're flying in the air, especially because you mostly just see them from below. Um, but what I look for is, and you can see on that right hand photo over there where it's feeding the baby, is the tree swallows have what I call a white saddlebag. So the white on their side extends up onto their rump a little bit um, and kind of looks like it's got some little saddlebags back there. Um, and that's a very distinctive marker um, that if you see that, you know you're looking at a tree swallow because the violet green does not have that. Um, also, uh, there's a white and an easy way to tell the violet green is the white on the face. On the tree swallow, it's just on the throat. On the violet green, it extends up onto the cheek and over top of the eye. Um, where that, so if you notice that there's white going above the eye, you're looking at a violet green, not a tree swallow. Um, so those are the two uh, markers that I use to see who I'm looking at when I'm seeing swallows. Um, and swallows uh, you will find in the upper canopies. Um, they are uh, insect eaters, insectivores, and they eat most of their insects on the wing. So if you see a very sleek, almost um, 
boomerang-ish shaped uh, bird flying around making sharp aerial turns and uh, usually they're hanging out in a small flock of uh, half a dozen or so or more um, grabbing insects that's what you're and usually they're diving through a cloud of insects even um, you're looking at your swallows uh, the third type of swallow uh, we have in the area that nests here, and many of you may be familiar with this guy because some people consider him to be somewhat pests, is the barn swallow. Um, they're also a spring and summer resident. Uh, they have a, a steel blue plumage on their back and a rusty underside. So they're distinctly different than your other uh, swallows that we have around here. Um, I mean, that just looking at their breasts alone, uh, the other two have white breasts and the barn swallow has a rusty breast. Um, but reason they're sometimes considered to be pests is they build, they don't use a house. The other two swallows use uh, birdhouses regularly, they use cavities. So we can put a birdhouse up and there's a good chance a swallow will move in, uh, the, either the violet green or the tree swallow. But the barn swallows don't use cavities. They build mud shelf nests on walls, under eaves, uh, inside barns if they can get in there, on the rafters. Um, and once they build that nest, they like to keep their nest clean. So all of their uh, refuge and waste goes over the side of the nest and makes quite the mess on anything that may be below that nest, whether it's your sidewalk, your uh, doorbell, um, if, you're, if they're in your barn, you know, your tractor or anything else you're storing in the barn, you learn when they're in the area, if you can't keep them out, you, you put tarps over that stuff because otherwise they get absolutely splattered in bird poo. Bird poo. Um, another distinctive uh, feature of the barn swallow is they have a distinctive forked tail. Um, the other two have somewhat of a forked tail, but nothing like what the barn swallow has. It has your iconic uh, sparrow fork. Uh, and then there's one other sparrow in the area I wanted to touch on. It's kind of a misnomer in that uh, it's the English house sparrow. And even though it's called a sparrow, it's, it's not a true sparrow that we have in uh, North America and South America. Um, it's what they call an old world sparrow or a uh, old world finch even. It's actually cl more closely related to finches than it is sparrows. Um, and so uh, it was introduced back at the turn of the uh, 20th century, um, early 1900s, late 1800s. Uh, in New York Central Park, um, along with the uh, dreaded starling that a lot of people who feed suet have uh, found to be quite the nuisance. Um, the Shakespeare Society of New York decided that to be true hoity-toity Shakespeareans, they needed the same birds in Central Park that was referenced in Shakespeare's plays. Um, and it was it was determined that the birds that he's referenced in his plays a lot was the English house sparrow and the European starling. And so they brought over 60 of each and released them in Central Park. Uh, the first batch of starlings died. They didn't make it through the winter, but the English house sparrow did. And they spread quite quickly all across the United States. Um, that's what happens when you introduce a species into an area where they don't belong. There's already some other animal or that is filling the same job or niche that they fill. They have to, to survive, they either have to outcompete the species that's already there or they have to learn how to survive differently. And when they learn how to survive differently, well, then they kind of break the mold. Um, and that's what the English house sparrow and eventually after two more tries, the uh, European starling did is they learned other ways to survive. Um, how the English house sparrow particularly survive, and hence the name house, they do use cavities and nest in houses. Um, they're pretty common to get into a swallow house in our area if your swallow house has a round hole rather than an oval or a diamond hole, um, shaped hole. Um, the oval and diamonds allow uh, swallows to fly into the hole and tuck their wings as they go in. Um, so they're, they're wider but shorter. Um, where the uh, full uh, one and a half inch hole, round hole that they would require the English house sparrow loves. Um, that's also the same size hole and cavity that bluebirds, particularly Western bluebirds like. Um, and the reason you do, don't see Western bluebirds around very often, almost at all, 
is because the English house sparrow has pretty much outcompeted them for nesting sites. Um, the English house sparrow happened to learn how to survive in a, a new environment, um, became quite aggressive, and it is known to, uh, one, it nests throughout the nesting season, um, so it can build a nest before a bluebird can even think about moving into a house, but it's also not above kicking other birds out of houses. They will fly in and destroy eggs, they will kill nestlings, they will attack and mob adults to take over that nest site. And so they're not the nicest bird to have around, but you know, they have been here now for over 100 years, they're not really going anywhere. There's really not much we can do to get rid of them at this point. Um, so we just kind of have to learn to live with them. And that's why we suggest, you know, for swallows, you use a, a, a oval or a diamond shaped hole, not a round hole. Um, and then for bluebirds, um, there's a few places, a con bluebird conservations that are trying different things to try to keep the English house sparrow out. Um, but a lot of it is just checking the nest box often. Um, and, you know, making sure that there are uh, bluebirds in that box and not English house sparrows. Um, and if they do come across English house sparrows in a bluebird box to destroy the nest, um, eggs and all, so that, you know, you're not having more English house sparrows next year to continue to uh, harm the uh, western bluebirds. Um, I just wanted to offer a, a special thank you to uh, Cornell Lab of Ornithology. Um, they're the foremost bird experts in the uh, United States. A great uh, uh, website that they run is allaboutbirds.org. Um, if you ever wanted to know anything about our native birds, All About Birds well, it has a uh, species profile for every species of bird uh, in the United States, North America and it has all the information you ever wanted. Pretty much any information you can find in any bird guide can be found on that website as well. Of course, you can't easily take it out into the field necessarily. Um, it's nice to have a book for that. Uh, but if you want to go home, reference, or study and learn about birds, it, it's a really great uh, website. Um, of course, Portland Audubon, Seattle Audubon, and I borrowed some images from Indiana Audubon, so I wanted to uh, give a shout out to them. And then, of course, Naturescaping in Southwest Washington for having me out once again to do a talk. Um, I always enjoy uh, talks with uh, your members and your community, um, and I look forward to them every year. Um, and that's pretty much the presentation, so uh, we can go ahead and get into my favorite part, which is questions. Let me redesign here a little bit, and where's my chat? There's my chat. Yeah, and I just want to uh, remind people that um... For those who maybe joined a little bit later, um, if you'd like to uh, ask a question, feel free yeah, to uh, type one into the chat. Um, or if you'd like to uh, ask a question out loud, uh, feel free to use the raise your hand icon. At the bottom of your Zoom window, there's a reactions button. If you press that, you'll see the raise hand icon. Um, and uh, yeah, it looks like there already are some uh, questions in the chat there, um, Brendan. One. Yeah. So I'll go ahead and uh, start with the uh, ones that are in the chat here. Uh, so it looks like our first one is from uh, Linda Schultz, who had a question about the uh, song sparrow. Um, and she wanted to know if the uh, song sparrow will eat from a seed feeder or only from the ground underneath. They may hop up onto a seed feeder again if they feel comfortable in your yard. Um, but mostly you're going to find your song sparrows hanging out on the ground. Um, here at the store, you know, we have several feeders at several different heights and almost never do I see the song sparrow up on the seed feeders. They're almost always down uh, on the ground eating the millet and the sunflower that's been dropped from above. Um, sometimes they'll hop up into the bushes um, or hop onto the low uh, ground trays that we have out back. Um, they'll <laughs> utilize those. Um, but they're not much for going on a, a feeder that's hanging Thanks, five feet or higher. Uh, did you have any other questions uh, about the song sparrow, Linda? Okay. Uh, Anne was asking if the slides would be available for records. Um, I can get those to. Uh, Marlene, um, and then she can distribute them to anyone who uh, might uh, like to have access to them. Um, also, this is being recorded, so it'll also be on uh, the uh, library's uh, YouTube page, I believe, is where they publish those. 
Um, Michelle D was asking, uh, what is the winter food source for hummingbirds? Um, so we do have a few flowers that do bloom and produce nectar during uh, the winter. Um, not many, but there are a few. Um, but also uh, they are known to raid uh, sapsucker wells. Um, sapsucker is a type of woodpecker and they make a scarred grid work on trees so that they ooze sap. Um, and they, they drink this sap for the sugar and it also catches bugs for them. Um, but uh, hummingbirds will seek out these uh, uh, sapsucker wells during the uh, winter to one, drink the sugary, uh, sugar rich uh, uh, sap. And also, um, you know, all hummingbirds get from nectar is energy. Uh, all of their nutrition comes from insects. They're big time insect eaters and they uh, catch insects usually on the wing, occasionally glean them off of plants, but usually catch them on the wing. And so they're not above also stealing the uh, uh, sap suckers uh, in case stuck uh, insects that are also um, on those sap sucker wells. Um, they also raid a lot of spider nests, eating the spider eggs and the baby spiders. Um, so if they find a spider nest, they'll attack that. And then of course, uh, you know, uh, people continue to feed uh, hummingbird feeders um, throughout the winter also. But if you do that, it's kind of an obligation. Um, hummingbirds survive cold weather by going into a form of suspended animation that's called torpor. Um, and so every night that it gets cold, their body temperatures drop down to the ambient temperature almost. Um, so they're not losing and expelling a lot of body heat and wasting energy at night when other, where they might otherwise freeze if they run out of energy. Um, but this process, you know, to boot back up from that, you know, almost no metabolic activity takes whatever little energy they have left after the night is pretty much drained the next morning when they wake up, so to speak, and get their bodies uh, going full bore again. And so it's really important for them to have access to uh, some sort of energy source first thing in the morning. Um, and the problem with our hummingbird feeders is if during freezing weather, if we're not careful or do something uh, to keep it from freezing, our hummingbird feeders may be frozen solid or have a, a solid layer of ice on top any, anyways, uh, preventing the hummingbird from being able to feed. So if you do choose to feed during the winter, it's important to have unfrozen fresh nectar out as close to dawn as possible. Um, otherwise, it's best to stop feeding in October, so by Halloween, so that they have a chance to find other sources of food before the freeze sets in. Um, and that way they will have uh, more reliable sources of food uh, available for them. But if they're, if you choose to feed and then you kind of stop putting, you know, making sure your free feeders unfrozen, they're going to continue to check your house and your feeder every morning that it's frozen. Um, and that wastes a lot of energy that they uh, otherwise could be spent you know, actually drinking nectar and refueling. And so um, it's kind of a, becomes an only time it becomes an obligation to feed birds is if you choose to feed hummingbirds during freezing weather. Um, yeah. oh, sorry, Brendan, I think there, uh, someone has their hand raised uh, and Phyllis, if you wanted to ask a question out loud, uh, you could do that now. Okay. Yes. Hi, Brandon. I wanted to know, what do I do? I have birds fly into my kitchen window all the time mm -hmm. and they get stunned. Some of them break things, but uh, I called the Audubon Society once and they said, just put them in a box, keep them warm up high where the predators can't get them and eventually they'll fly away. Is that right? Also, well, I want to know, how do I keep the squirrels out of my bird feeders? Because the squirrels go and eat all the seeds. Yeah. Uh, so with the, the window strikes, um, what the Audubon suggested, that's the best way to care for a, window, a bird that's hit a window um, so that they can uh, recover and hopefully survive. Not all birds do, but usually in a, a warm box with like a towel up away from predators, they'll regain their senses safely and then you know can fly off if they're going to survive. Um, but to prevent them from hitting the windows in the first place, um, you can use what are called, um, well, window decals. Um, they're uh, static cling decals. They come in different forms. Some are white and black, some are colored. The ones I like are somewhat look like frosted glass, but they're UV reflective. Um, and birds can see the UV spectrum where we can't. So they look like frosted glass to us. So they're very unobtrusive to our ability to look through the window but the birds see bright blue purple. 
Um, and what that does and those decals do is they tell them that there's there's something there, uh, like a barrier. And so they can swerve and fly away before they hit the window. Um, problem is windows without decals either if there's two windows on, you know, across from each other in a house, they're seeing what appears to be a tunnel. Um, or the, what more commonly happens is the window and the way their eyes work, the window turns into a mirror and it's reflecting the, uh, the foliage and the yard behind them. And so they think it's just a continuation of the yard. Um, and those uh, decals help break up those patterns um, and warn them that there's a barrier there so that they don't run into it. Um, as for squirrels, um, there are lots of uh, methods to try to thwart squirrels. The most reliable methods are either a, uh, a feeder that is designed to be squirrel resistant or squirrel proof. Um, some are definitely better than others. Uh, the best brand that we found on the market and the one we've chosen to carry because it has proven itself time and time again to be the most successful is the line of squirrel buster feeders by Brome Bird Care. Um, the other thing you can do is treat your seeds with a uh, pepper oil. Um, we sell one called Flaming Squirrel Seed Sauce. Um, and birds don't perceive spicy like mammals do. So a squirrel gets a mouthful of burning hot and generally they don't like that and won't come back to that feeder for a while where birds can eat to their heart's content and there's no ill effects really to them from it. Um, otherwise, it's you got to have your feeder positioned in the very like middle of the yard with no way that he can jump to it from a tree or a building and then uh, put some sort of what we call a squirrel baffle on the pole so they can't climb it. Okay. And we can help with all of those situations here in the store as well, or any of the backyard bird shops can. Good. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Anytime. Um, Marlene had a question about a good app for bird ID. Um, there are several out there. I've heard good things um, about the, um, I think Cornell has one out. Um, trying to remember the name of that one. Uh, eBird, I think, has one. That's a good one too. Um, but what I like the best is um, there's an app called uh, iBird Pro. Um, you can get it on both Android and on uh, Apple uh, phones. Um, and it is just a, has every bird in the North America, United States. There's a couple different versions. Um, and usually only the, the full version costs about $14, $15. Sometimes you can get it on sale for less. I once saw it for $2, um, but that, that was a long time ago. I haven't seen it that low since. Um, but it, it has access, it's, it's pretty much a mobile version of allaboutbirds.org. You can find any information on a species you want. Um, you can even uh, make it uh, sort by uh, silhouette, or you can make it sort by identifying markers. It, it's a really powerful app that is really easy to use. You don't have to use all the complicated features. Um, I highly recommend that one. Let's see. Thank you, Kristen. I appreciate the uh, praise. Uh, looks like Jean Kent uh, had to leave early. Um, ba -ba 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 -ba. Ah, Kathleen um, has a question. If a bird was nesting in a mason bee box but didn't produce eggs, then vacated the box, what does that mean? Um, sometimes nests just aren't successful. Um, whether the uh, breeding didn't take or perhaps uh, maybe eggs were laid but were uh, taken uh, by a predator. Um, but most likely what you saw was uh, some birds, part of their courtship behavior is the male building multiple nest sites and that the female chooses which nest to utilize. Um, so it may have been uh, that situation where the male had built multiple nest sites um, the female checked it out, maybe hung out there for a couple days, but then decided that wasn't the house she wanted to go with. Um, so sometimes for a male to uh, attract a female, he has to own multiple properties um, and give her the pick of the best one. Um, so that's probably what you saw there. Either that or after they built the nest, maybe there was too much predator activity or too much uh, human activity in the area um, that just made them decide that it wasn't such a great nesting site after all. Uh, 
Uh, Linda Schultz has another question. Um, they look similar to a pine siskin feeder. So I was wondering about that. How do you keep, um, which ones were we uh, thinking looked like a pine siskin? Was that the uh, song sparrow? Uh, yes, it looks like uh, Linda just commented and said yes, Song Sparrow. <laughs> okay. Um, they, yeah, they kind of look similar in plumage, uh, but there are definitely distinct differences. They're much larger than a, a, a pine siskin. Um, they're also much bulkier, where a pine siskin is going to, looks mostly sleek and about the size of the goldfinch. Your Song Sparrow is uh, much, much more round and also just overall more husky. Um, and so, and also they, uh, they don't tend to go up on feeders. You see them mostly on the ground. So between uh, the size difference and the just shape difference, um, as well as where they're hanging out is the best way to tell the difference between a pine siskin. And also the song sparrows are here year round, but the uh, siskins are generally only down during the winter. Otherwise they hang out at higher elevations for the most part. Um, and then you were wondering how to keep squirrels out of your ground feeders. Um, that is a, uh, a challenging problem um, because you don't really want to put like an exclusion uh, cage around your ground feeder because that would exclude some of your larger sparrows as well and you'd want them to be able to eat as well as your doves and your uh, pigeons if you have uh, bantail pigeons. Um, so what I find works the best to keep squirrels out of ground feeders is control what you feed in them. Uh, don't put sunflower in a ground feeder and don't put any sort of nuts in a ground feeder. Um, squirrels tend not to like millet seed and they tend not to care much for cracked corn. And millet seed and cracked corn are two favorite foods of ground birds. Um, so if you just stock uh, cracked corn and primarily millet in your ground feeders, it's very unlikely a squirrel is going to bother it very much, especially if there's other foods for them to eat. Uh, only time I've ever seen squirrels get a taste for millet is if they can't get any sunflower or any nuts in your yard or anyone else's nearby yard, then they will resign themselves to eat the seed they don't really care for. Um, but otherwise, uh, they generally don't bother it. And yes, uh, wrapping Christmas lights, especially the C6, C7 bulbs, uh, do help keep uh, hummingbird feeders from freezing. Um, I, before they came out with actual heaters made for hummingbird feeders, that's what I used to do to keep mine unfrozen during the winter was wrap a, a couple uh, loops of uh, C7 Christmas light bulbs around them. Uh, Bonnie says she brings her hummingbird feeders inside at night and puts them back out just before dawn. That is definitely a, a very good method. A lot of people do that. Um, some folks like myself who don't like to get up at dawn, um, <laughs> uh, we tend not to prefer that method. Um, I Now that there are hummingbird heaters out, that's what I would use. Um, and there's a couple of them that we sell at the store, particularly during the winter months. Um, and I should be getting a restock of hopefully this week. And I know we're supposed to possibly getting some freezing weather this week as well, I heard. Um, but uh, yes, uh, if, if you're up early in the morning, you can definitely just bring your hummingbird feeder at, in at night and put it back out in the morning. Um, important note, if you are bringing your feeders in at night or if you're adding a, an outside heat source like Christmas lights or uh, one of our bird uh, hummingbird feeder heaters, is you want to change your nectar like it's spring and summer. So you want to change that nectar at least twice a week. Normally during fall and winter, you can get away with once a week because it's not as warm out and it doesn't spoil as easy. But since you're adding uh, an external heat source or bringing it inside where it's warmer, you need to continue that summer spring regimen of changing it twice a week so it doesn't spoil on you. Uh, Dorothy asked how long the decals are good for. Um, if they're not the UV reflective decals, they're they're good for as long as they stick to the window and don't get like sun baked and start falling apart. The UV uh, reflective ones, they recommend to replace every four to six months because unfortunately to be UV reflective, they can't be UV neutral. And so the sun does eventually bake the UV-ness out of them. Uh, but in our area, I found so long as your window isn't in direct sunlight all day or most of the day, um, they tend to last six months to a year. Um, so if you replace them once a year, you're usually pretty good. If you replace them every six months, you're probably golden. 
Um, if you start noticing that birds are occasionally striking your windows again, it's probably a sign you need to replace your decals. Uh, Linda Peterson had, uh, can you put the pepper stuff on a suet container? Um, you could, uh, but they also make pepper suet um, that has the pepper in the suet itself. And it works the same way as the seed does. Squirrel gets a mouthful of hot um, and the birds don't. Um, so yeah, you could paint your, uh, if you want to keep them from chewing on a feeder, you can definitely paint the edge of a feeder with the pepper oil, let it soak into the wood. Um, and that sometimes helps keep them from chewing the feeder itself. Um, but to keep them from eating all the suet, I would use a uh, actual pepper suet. Um, and the app I recommend is iBird Pro. And it again, iBird Pro is available on both uh, Android and on uh, Apple phones. Uh, looks like Linda uh, answered the question with the pepper cakes. Uh, she is correct. We do have cakes with the pepper inside, as I just mentioned. Um, boom, boom, boom. Ah, Michelle D has a question about uh, binoculars for backyard viewing versus out in the wild blue lawn yonder. Um, important uh, part of using uh, bird binoculars in a, a smaller area like a yard is your close focus. Um, so all your binoculars have a certain distance that they can uh, begin to focus on. Um, so the closer the close focus, the better they are for smaller areas like backyards. Um, we sell one here at the store that has a uh, five or six foot uh, close focus. Um, it's called the uh, Oregon 4 from Opticron. And I can actually, when I'm standing, I'm about 6'6'1", six, six, um, when I'm standing and look down, I can actually get them to bring my toes and the toes of my shoes into focus. Um, and I find those are great for backyards. They're smallish, they're light, and they're very powerful for, uh, for their price. Um, there, so that's what you want to look for if you're looking for a good pair of binoculars for the backyard is how, how far out that close focus is. Some, some binoculars don't have a close focus any closer than 12, 10 or 12 feet. And in some backyards, that's just not going to be very useful. Um, but the uh, ones with like a, a five or six foot uh, close focus uh, tend to work a lot better. Uh, ah, yes, Pam has a very good question. Um, last year, we had to stop feeding due to a salmonella outbreak. Um, are we safe this year? Uh, at this point, we're probably safe this year. Um, every year that the pine siskins come down off the mountains and join the goldfinch flocks at our feeders, there's always small isolated cases of salmonella outbreaks. Um, they tend to, in my experience, have a very poor immune system compared to the other birds, and they're not used to flocking in such large groups like they do during the winter down at our feeders. And so it becomes a, a place of vector for them to spread the uh, salmonella um, bacteria. Um, they One, they drop it in their feces, and if their feces ends up in the food, as they sometimes do if you have trays, uh, then other birds are exposed to that, um, or your ground birds are exposed to it on the ground. Um, and they also, once they catch salmonella, the, the, uh, the respiratory uh, infection from it, they can spread it through their breath as well. So as they're breathing on the seed and breathing on other birds, they're, they're spreading it that way also. Um, and the important way to, easy way to clean that up and help is one, keep your feeders clean. Um, but if you start noticing fluffy, lethargic, sick looking birds, um, one or two, usually it's just maybe a small uh, isolated case, but if you start noticing, you know, four or five, half a dozen, um, pull your feeders down, clean them with uh, a 10% bleach solution. So uh, 10 parts water, one part bleach and leave them down for one to two weeks. Um, they officially recommend two weeks. I found usually one week is, is usually enough time. Um, if you start seeing, uh, again, sick, fluffy, lethargic birds after you put it back out, pull them down and leave them down for two weeks at that point um, and clean them again with a 10% bleach solution. Um, but yeah, this year we didn't have near as many pine siskins. Last year it was what they called a super flight. We saw more pine siskins across the country than we've seen in decades. Um, and so that's what led to that nationwide salmonella outbreak at feeders. Um, it, it was a very rare thing that we've never seen really before and hopefully we won't see since 
Um, but yeah, this year they weren't here in quite such uh, large numbers. And so any salmonella outbreaks this year were just small isolated cases in single yards or neighborhoods, in which case they just need to clean up their feeders and leave them down for a week or two. Uh, Marlene noted that the hummingbird feeder that attaches to the window usually doesn't freeze unless it's really, really cold. Um, that is also true. Um, since it uh, sticks to the window, you have the warmth from inside the house radiating out from the window, and that's usually enough to keep uh, the hummingbird liquid from freezing. Um, unless it, you know, noted, unless it does get really cold, and when we get really, really cold, then even that can't keep up, but um, yeah. And uh, looks like that is it for the questions in the chat. Um, did anyone else have any questions they wanted to ask or any photos they wanted to see if maybe I could get an ID on for you? Okay, well, uh, thank you everyone for uh, coming and attending our talk. Um, I always enjoy doing these. Um, if you have any other uh, nonprofit or community groups that you uh, want to have us come out and do a talk with, I'm always happy to, uh, to do that sort of stuff. Um, and I hope again that uh, Marlene will have me out at Naturescaping either through Zoom or maybe someday back out at the, uh, at the gardens once more and so we can get together again. And uh, thank you, yeah. Elliot. You for count on uh, hosting it, us. What's that, Marlene? I said you can count on us having you back. <laughs> well, I really enjoy it. You're, you're my uh, best talks, so. Thank you. We love you, too. <laughs> Thank you. And if you haven't been out to check out their gardens, go do so. It's an amazing garden. Well, thank you so much, Brandon. I really appreciate it. And um, before we go, uh, Brandon or Marlene, did you have any uh, final final words? Um, if, if anyone needs suet, uh, we are having our annual suet sale at the Backyard Bird Shop through the end of February. Um, so there's about another week or so left on that. Um, you can get uh, buy six and get a free one. Or if you buy a case of 12, you save an extra 20% off the already discounted case price. Um, and if you need any squirrel proof feeders or hummingbird heaters, hopefully I'll be restocked on those uh, after Tuesday, um, so long as my warehouse delivers them as they're supposed to. <laughs> but you know how things are this time. They're right now with deliveries, so. And yeah, I will uh, send my uh, presentation to Marlene so that she can distribute it to anyone who would uh, like to have a copy. Great, and everyone will see an email uh, head out with the link to the recording, and I'll just I'll include that link uh, in that same email. <laughs> okay, Marlene, that was any good. <laughs> nope, just again, remind everybody about our plant sale. That's our basically one fundraiser for the year for naturescaping, so we can keep those gardens going. Again, I encourage you to contact me at the email that's listed at the very beginning on the chat um, that has my email address. And you asked about that. It's it's on the chat. Oh, there it is again. Thank you, Elliot. Um, yeah, contact me if you want to work the plant sale and uh, or any other volunteering. Check our website. Check keep checking our website for more information about the sale. Thanks again to Brandon and Elliot, our wonderful partners, and uh, hope to see y'all at the guards. Thank you, everyone. Bye. 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 <laughs>